Is investment something that's always been on your mind, but you don't quite know how to get started on that journey? We are here to set you on the right course. Welcome to My Cash Flow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We are all about getting out of the rat race through creating positive passive income through real estate investing. Here you'll hear from regular people just like you and the professionals who support us towards greater wealth. Learn before you earn, move from analysis to action, and find the right path to attaining the success that you've always dreamed of for yourself. Now, here's your host, Athena. Welcome, everyone, to Cashflow Academy's podcast series. We bring you interviews with real estate investors who've gotten out of the rat race and the businesses that support them towards greater wealth. Today, I have Christy Sertwell from Sertwell Investments, who is going to talk about many things, but was invited to come talk to us about ADUs and whether they're worth the trouble, how to get an ADU going, and what the process is. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. So Christy, why don't we start by just kind of introducing you, kind of your background, where you grew up, did you always live in Los Angeles, or did you move here, kind of your background and how you came to do what you do. Oh, sure. Well, thanks for having me, Athena. I appreciate it. I actually moved about 12 years ago from Canada, so just finally decided I just, I had good jobs, but just jobs I didn't really like doing. Mm. I think I was making 32000 was the and trying to climb the corporate ladder and just was something that wasn't for me anymore. Um. I just wanted to do something in real estate. I've always had an interest. And of course, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. As a lot of people have got me thinking of other ways to create wealth for myself. So I had bought a couple of rental properties up there, but really couldn't figure out how to get ahead to the next level. Mm. And I knew that the house flipping business was, at least I heard, it could be profitable in the States. So I came down and just started taking some real estate classes and ended up making a business out of it. So I started uh, buying my first houses around 2008, which the timing actually couldn't have been better because that was just after the crash had happened in 2007 and just been doing it ever since. And then just recently sort of got into to doing some of these ADUs, accessory mm -hmm. dwelling units. So I guess that's why you have me today to give you some more detail on that. Yeah, yeah. Because I believe you should learn from people who are doing it, not people who are up on a stage talking about how it's possible, right? But, I love hearing people talk about their process and the real deal, we'll call it, right? So, so you moved here like in 2007 sometime, yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah. You were inspired by books, or did you watch a TV program? I mean, and why California? From uh, that, you grew up on the East Coast, right? Like, why didn't you flip in Florida or some other state? How did you come to pick California? I closed my eyes and pointed on the map. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. And honestly, it didn't even have anything to do with the weather. But in hindsight, I'm glad I ended up here. I was also considering Ohio because I'm from Toronto area. And uh -huh. you know, that's just a short drive over the border. But gosh, in hindsight, the gloomy winters would have just been just like back home. But right. Uh, yeah, I just, there was a program way back in the day called Nouveau Riche. And I took some courses and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to get a one way ticket to LA. And just, one way. Wow. I did. And I, I had one check bag and one carry on, and that was it. Back then, Airbnb didn't even exist. So I, I had, found an apartment through Craigslist or unreliable source, but mm. it was a bit of a, a hope and a prayer in the beginning. But I came here with the desire. And the first thing I did was I, I tried to find people who were actually doing it. Mm. And I did. You go to these real estate meetings and eventually people say they're doing this or that. Well, I actually looked some of them up. and I'm like, okay, here's a company that's actually flipping houses. So you can make a business out of it. Mm -hmm. So I knew it could be done. It was just a matter of figuring out how can I do it? How do I yeah. get the knowledge? How do I get the money? How do I get started? So, right. So did you move here like with a million dollars in the, in your bank account or like, how did you well, get started? How much seed money? Well, I had, so on my $30,000 job a year in Canada, 
I was able to buy my own house and a rental property. And to move down here, I sold the rental property, and I think I had made about 70000 Now, mind you, that's not like in a few months' time like you can make in California. That was over several year period of it growing in equity. I had a small investment to start. But really, I didn't have I didn't have any knowledge. You know, I had common sense. Mm-hmm. Mars, that's about it. But yeah, just a small investment to come down. And obviously, I had to go through immigration process and get my work permits. But that's another. <laughs> that's, that's another, another story. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just obviously to flip houses, you have to have some money in the bank. You know, there right. are ways to fully leverage, and I even do that now. When I buy my houses to flip, I can fully fund them, the purchase and the rehab. Right. But you still need to have a little bit of something in the bank to, for carrying costs and incidentals. That's mm-hmm. just the reality of the business. Right. Especially you didn't have a job when you moved here, I assumed, right? You didn't come here nope, with a job already lined up, a no, paycheck? No. Nope, I couldn't. So the, the work visa I'm on is for, uh, you know, to be a business owner or an investor. I had to make it happen or I was going back. (laughs) Right. Which if that's the worst that happens to you, I guess it's not so bad. You give it a shot and it doesn't work and you go home, right? So in between the time that you started flipping and now, how many houses would you say you flipped over those years? And how many more recent, like last year, how many did you flip? I think probably since 2008, I've bought about 200. 200 houses. Wow. So in 2013, I kept a bunch of those as rentals. I've since sold those. Mm -hmm. And now I've got a few recently that I'm going to keep as rentals. But yeah, my purchases have been around that. And then, of course, flip them. Those are ones out the door. So total transactions may be closer to 350 to 400. Right. Wow. Okay. So, So in flipping homes, I would assume... You have to run crews. You don't do the construction yourself, right? You don't nail every nail and put in every window. So so how many crews do you think you have going at once on average? Well, in the beginning, I was going through, and when I say interview, I mean basically giving a general contractor the chance to, to prove himself on a job. And so I went through a few just trying to figure out who I could work with. And I'm not a one and done. I want relationships. Right. So, Finally, I got to the point where several years ago, I met a great general contractor. So between him, we're running a crew of about 26 guys right now. Okay. The guy in charge of figuring out where they go every day, and he just moves them around based on what skills they have and what okay. we need where on what job site. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's amazing. You're not managing the crews anymore. He basically took that over? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, at some point, as I get busier, I'll bring in another general contractor. But for now, this one guy can do uh, it with his people. Can just do it with the 26 guys. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, a lot of people to manage, right? So, okay. And how many, just to give people an idea, how many rehabs or flips do you have going on right now? I think I'm somewhere between 12 and 15. Wow. Um, if the video is coming through, I actually have my whiteboard with all my deals on it right behind me. <laughs> yeah, so... Oh, uh, that would be wonderful to see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm at least a dozen, and yeah. you know they're all in various stages. So some I just have purchased, so we're just starting construction. Some are right in the middle. Some of these construction projects take a while because mm. of ADUs or additions. And then mm-hmm. we're in the final stages where we're staging them and getting them ready for sale. So mm-hmm. we're all in different stages. All in different cities or do you mainly focus on one city when you flip homes or how does that work for you? I'm mostly in Los Angeles and Orange Counties. But okay. I also go to Ventura, as far north as Ventura County, out east to San Bernardino Riverside Counties, and then as far south to north San Diego County. Wow. So that's pretty spread out. Yes. And so you don't visit those homes every day, right? You're not driving around? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) No, no. I'll go, obviously, to see them the first time and get them into escrow. Mm -hmm. And then probably again, once I've purchased them, just to walk the job with the contractor to figure out what Uh to do. And then there's some times in between I need to 
run down there and check on anything. I do that, but generally it's that part of it's fairly hands off for me. So the general contractors managing most all of that. Yeah. Okay. And then in general, because I want to move on to the ADUs, but in general, where do you find your deals? Who brings you the homes to buy? The golden question <laughs> <laughs> that everybody wants to know, right? Okay, yeah. I do it 100% off referral. Uh-huh. And so I, when I came to the U.S., the first thing I did was I joined a networking group. Mm. And I don't mean a real, and real estate investing groups are super important, but that's not what I'm talking about when I say a group. Okay. Join business networking type of group. So other okay. small business owners that maybe have CPAs, business attorneys, just other small businesses that have an, an interest to help my business grow as I have an interest to help their business grow. Got it. The more people that know about what I do, the more referrals I get. Right. Wow. So that's where all of my, and now I should say there was an exception last year. I actually got two deals off the MLS, but those properties have, were on the MLS for, you know, about 90 days. They were just sitting there a while. Right. And generally, I don't go after anything on the MLS that's been on there a week because it's just too competitive. Right. Just when you can't, being a house flipper, you can't afford to pay like what I'll call retail, right? You have to get some kind of discount to have some buffer to make a profit, right? It has to have that. Yeah, that's that right. And potential my, profit. My niche is buying hoarded houses. And oh, okay. If you've seen that TV show, Hoarders, those are the houses that I buy. So when people know that's your niche, then these are, let's put it this way. I'm paying market value for the condition the home is in. Got it. Okay. So obviously that's at a discount because that's what the home is worth. If they're just completely, you know, dilapidated in, in most cases. Uh-huh. So they're kind of hoarder homes. So there's a lot of stuff in that home. Yes. yes. And is the hoarder person still living there or is it like their family that takes over? Maybe they passed away or... Yeah, I'm usually dealing with the family members. So right, either, okay. either that person has gone into an assisted living home or they've passed away and I'm dealing with the heirs mm. you know, on the purchase of that property. Okay. Yeah. Why do you suppose, what's the specialness of doing the, why do you think you're able to do hoarder homes? I just really have a compassion for these people whether it be the person with the hoarding disorder or with the family members, because it's mm. such an emotional process. When an heir comes from out of state to handle the affairs of the estate and they realize how their aunt or uncle had been living, yeah, it's there's every emotion involved with that. There's overwhelm, there's disbelief, there's embarrassment, there's guilt, there's sadness. Mm. Uh, all of that goes into that. And when, when as a human to human, I can understand, you know, what they're going through. And I think when, when you're able to build that trust with that person, then that's when you can put a win-win deal together. Right. And so I guess too, once you have this knack, people know that you do and it and it spreads somehow you become the hoarder home house flipper? Like, do people know you as that after a while? Or? They do, actually. And when I show up to meet with these sellers, they're less embarrassed because they know that I've seen it all. They're like, yeah. well, I'm, they say, well, I don't know if you've seen worse or, you know, I said, don't worry about it. I've seen it all. I'll just, you can wait outside. I'll go inside and just take a quick look and come back out. And it's almost like more of a comfort to them to know that that is what I specialize in. So it's not a shock factor to me when I walk in and see it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Wow. Okay. So, so now to our main <laughs> topic that everyone wants to hear about is because I could talk all day long about your house flipping, but why don't you kind of briefly tell us first, what is an ADU? Why are we all of a sudden hearing about ADUs and kind of the process? But first just tell us what exactly is this thing? Sure. Well, I only found out about it last year and I, I'm trying to remember when the state actually made it a new rule. I think mm -hmm. it might have been actually 2017. 
Yeah, it was the year before, I think, yeah. Yeah, so I only learned about this last year. And so ADU, it's Accessory Dwelling Unit, is what it stands for. And basically all that is, is a granny store. So, you know, some kind of a secondary house on a property. And by the way, you can build these on single-family R1 zone lots. And it's statewide. So they're just basically mini houses. Mini houses, okay. Yeah, I mean, small houses, tiny houses, or not so tiny houses. I've got one that's 750 square feet right now. Okay. A bedroom, that's not so tiny. Right. So you're saying it's a home that's being new construction built, right? I'm uh, building them that way. I'm doing new construction. You can also, I guess, you could bring in a manufactured home or mm-hmm. even a mobile home. I'm not sure about that. Mm-hmm. Or you can also convert existing space. So if there's a large a rumpus room or a garage that's already existing on the property, you could convert that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's what people typically in the past called granny unit or in-law quarters, something like People yes. used to say those words, right? Okay. And sometimes with these in-law quarters, they could only be sort of a, a living space in a bathroom. Well, with mm-hmm. ADUs, you can actually have a full-on kitchen. It's literally a second house with a full kitchen, full bath, bedroom, you know, everything like a normal house would be. It's just usually smaller. It's got to be mm-hmm. smaller than the main house. Okay. So if the lot is zoned for one house, mm-hmm. you're actually not having to obey those rules anymore. You can have this extra dwelling on there. Yes. And it's okay. legal to do that. Okay, so that's interesting. And then, yeah, so it's fairly new, right? So how many ADUs, I thought you just did one because I saw that on your Facebook page, but how many ADUs have you done so far? <laughs> well, somehow I, I'm up to 11 right now. So. Oh my God. <laughs> Boy, when you yeah. do something, you go all out, huh? I'm well, thinking, oh, how cute she's putting an ADU <laughs> on her home. <laughs> well, I got excited about ADUs because I thought, you know, the government makes some interesting decisions sometimes. Mm-hmm. But here's one they've made that could actually benefit the entrepreneur slash real estate investor. Mm. I thought, this can't be true. How can you put two houses on an R1 lo- zone lot? Right. I, I better take advantage of this while it lasts. Right. So I just started building a couple and it just sort of happened by chance that these new properties I was buying to flip Mm-hmm. I would check out the minimum lot square footage. It met mm-hmm. the requirement of the city, the setbacks, you know, the, the space to build it. They could all fit one. So I thought, well, why not just keep building these? Yeah. Wow. So, anyway, up to a well, Especially if you're already there rehabbing the property, right? That's right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and I thought you had to live there. So that's interesting that you didn't live in some of these and they let you build the ADU, right? It's really dependent city by city. Okay. So actually, I've run into that in a couple of cities right now, actually. And I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get around that. I might actually live in one for a while and keep the utilities in my name for both houses. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that is a roadblock on a couple of them I'm doing. But city of L.A., for example, you can rent both of them. No problem. Well, wow. so I, I just have a feeling people are going to look back years from now and say, how can this second unit be legal and this property is zoned R1? How can this right. be legal? And, you know, it'll be a thing where it just gets grandfathered in and the homeowner will have a nice extra value. Mm-hmm. Because it, it's you mean if they ever shut this down? <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. it'll happen over time. They change the rules. So you have to take advantage of it while it's still around. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so when you're looking to build one of these, why don't you, I don't know if you can just pick one and use it as an example, or or if you could just walk us through what is the process you go through to, first of all, determine whether you can have an ADU on the property, and then if it's worthwhile to do, like, is there the cost benefit kind of, what can you rent it out right away, or do you have to wait? How do you figure out whether you should put an ADU on a property? Well, I guess the first step is to go to the city and get their ADU requirements because each city has separate 
list of things that they require. So the lot size has to be a minimum size. If your lot size doesn't meet that minimum, forget it. It's, you can't do it. Okay. The setbacks for some cities are only five feet from the lot line. Other mm -hmm. cities, it's 15 feet. So if you are standing in your backyard going, I need to be 15 feet away from that wall and that wall, and you can't sort of roughly measure out a space that that ADU will fit, then it's not going to fit. Okay. So just a list of rules that the city will give you. And then the next step is to, if you decide you want to go ahead with it, is get an architect to draw it out for you. And I guess it's really case by case if a homeowner thinks they want to do this or not. If they are going to own this property for a long time and they want a way to have extra income, I think it's great. Do it now while the rule exists because down the road, they'll change the rule and you won't be able to do this. There's lots of properties in Long Beach, for example, that have sort of a rumpus room attached to the garage. Right. You can convert those spaces. So why not convert it and add in a kitchen and a bathroom while you're legally allowed to, and then it's grandfathered in. Right. Then you've got the, the option to have it as an extra room for family members or extra income if you want to rent it. Right. So you go to the city, figure out what their requirements are, then go back to your property and see if it, the minimum is there. So are there a minimum square footage requirements for how big the ADU has to be? Yeah, there's also, it can't be bigger than a certain percentage of the main house. Uh -huh. For one city, for example, it can't be more than 45% of the square footage of the main house. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, different rules like that. Yeah, I heard the city next door here, Redondo Beach, it's something like that. Can't be more than a certain, like 50%, I think, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you encountered any minimum square footage requirements? Like you can't build it because people might say, oh, I could get a 250 square foot room there. I don't know. Yeah. You haven't encountered minimums? I don't think I've encountered a minimum, but okay. you know, like what I wanted to do is make sure you can fit a kitchen and a bathroom in all of them. Mm. So really, if you think about the size that a studio would be, like a 350 to 400 square foot space normally. Mm -hmm. So, and that's quite possible to have a full size kitchen and bathroom in. For one bedroom, I think the smallest one bedroom I have is 500 square feet. Okay. You want to be much smaller than that, or you're just it's too crammed. Right. But yeah, I mean anything smaller than that, I don't know if there's been a minimum. Okay. There's definitely maximums. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you that people should grab the opportunity because the whenever, so like the city of Lomita, there's a lot of bonus rooms that are living spaces, right? These 1930s homes that have like an extra dwelling in the back. So, and people fight to get those properties because there's very few single family homes with those extra units. So I'm definitely looking forward when people look back at this time, they'll be, oh, I should have done it, right? Yes, yes. Because it makes the property more appealing to the next buyer as well, not only yes. for yourself, but yeah. Okay, and do most cities allow you to rent it out right away, or are you supposed to occupy, is your family supposed to be occupying that? Because I know part of this was the housing shortage, right? So I imagine cities are letting people rent these out, or are you finding problems with that, or holding periods maybe? Well, it's all case by case. You have to really know what you're allowed to do, and that's why when you get those city requirements, you have to just read through the detail of it. So what I've just found out with City of Long Beach, for example, is if you rent the main house to a tenant, you have to be occupying the ADU. If you rent the ADU, you have to be occupying the main house. With the exception if your tenant in the main house also wants to be renting the ADU, then that's okay. You can have one lease that encompasses both the houses. They will okay. allow that. Okay, so they just want to make sure a homeowner is there somehow, that it's not being used as multiple re in Long Beach, in your example. I guess they're just trying to make sure someone, that you don't have multiple families on one property. Right. And luckily, the tenant in my main house in the Long Beach one wants to actually rent the back one as well. So that is allowed city of Long Beach 
so far my understanding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm reading it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what's the process of, and I know it's hard because you have ADUs in all the different cities, but if you could use an example of what are the steps, so once you know your property would qualify, you then have to go get permits, how long does that typically take? And then the construction, I think people are curious, how long does that construction take since it's ground up pretty in most cases? And what's the kind of average cost? So yeah, if you could explain to us that part. Yeah, gosh, and this is really city by city too. But yeah. And some cities are just super easy to work with. Other cities are backlogged and they just do not have a good process. Mm. Example, Would you say those are the bigger cities that are backlogged or the small? Which do you think it's the size of the city or? Uh, no, I think it's just how organized or disorganized they are. Okay. For example, City of Garden Grove, super disorganized. You can call for an inspection and you might be lucky to get it eight days from now. Mm -hmm. You're waiting for your sewer inspector to come. So you call for the ins you finish the sewer, you call for the inspection, you can't come for eight days. Your whole project wow. is on hold for, for all those days. days. Wow. And sometimes they call and cancel because they just they can't make it or they're too busy or whatever the case is, you have to call back and reschedule. So they just don't really have a good system in place. But uh. if you live there and you're you've got time you know, you don't have to worry about things like this. If this is your business and you're trying to flip this property and get on with things, then time is money because your holding costs can really add up. Mm -hmm. So, but generally it's just having a contractor who can stay on top of things for you. It's just really case by case, just trying to learn the rules of each city that you're going to do this in. Got it. Yeah. So if you're not used to that city, then you're kind of going in blindly, right? I mean, you know, because you went through it now, but someone else might not know. Right. And are inefficient, their planning department is. Part of it is, is this is all new to all the cities. So they mm -hmm. have to kind of scramble and put together, well, what are their rules for ADU? Mm -hmm. So half of them don't even know what they're doing. They're kind of making it up as they go along. Mm. But yeah, it's just it's trying to talk to somebody at the city and learn as much as you can up front so you know what your costs are going to be and how long it's going to take you. It's not an exact science, unfortunately. Right. So on average, what would you say it's been taking you to build one of these? Well, once we finally get permits, the building mm. is not too bad. Anywhere from three months on the quick side, five months on the slower side. Okay. And the other thing is, is the rain just slows things up, too. Right. So every time, you know, we get a, a rainfall that's stopping something along the way from moving along, you know, the, we've just had delays with the foundation because it's just been raining so much here. Yeah. Okay. And so what would you say would be a good guess on, or what would be a yeah a good guess on what the cost would be to build one of these. Is there a price per square foot? I'm, I imagine you're keeping it fairly, you know, you're not putting fancy stuff into this unit, right? It's pretty basic materials that you're using, or do you go fancy? No, they're pretty basic. Uh, generally, you have to match the look of the main house. You can't do something, you know, wildly different. My actual construction costs have been so far 170 to 180 a square foot. Okay, so that's pretty good. Yeah, and the soft costs have been anywhere. And when I say soft costs, that would include architect drawings, structural, city permits, obviously, any other city fees like their school fees and park fees and stuff like this you have to, mm -hmm. you have to get. Sewer tie-in fees, water meter fees if you have to get a separate water meter, just any other fees that go along with that. On the low end, I think 20000 on the high end, 40000 and something. So just be prepared for that. I would say it, your minimums are really around 20000 Okay. Yeah, just for your soft costs. That's before you even break ground. Before you even get started, yeah. Wow. So that's a lot of money for most people, right? Mm -hmm. But if you can rent out that back house now, that should pay for itself. So the cost-benefit... People have to figure out how much they can rent their back house for. Right. 
And generally, I'm finding overall, to give you a ballpark on this, right. it's meeting the 1% rule. Okay. So let's say my soft costs and my construction costs total 180000 mm -hmm. But I know that I'm going to get 1800 in rent a month. Mm -hmm. then is it worth it for somebody to spend 180 to get that 1% in rent every month? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if you could get a loan on that or if you can pay for it free and clear, that's nice extra income coming in. Right. It also adds more value than the 180000 I think, in resale value, right? If someone were to sell their home one day and it's got this extra home, hopefully the rent's gone up, but it's going to probably add va value more than the, the money they spent on it, right? In theory, it should, but mm -hmm. right now, it's not, mm -hmm. because none of these are getting appraised at the prices that they should be. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and that is because there's nothing to compare it to, because ADUs are so new, the appraisers don't know whether to just comp it as a single-family house, or yeah. as a lot, or what they should do. So, yeah, and you can't really compare it to a duplex, because it's not legally a duplex. That's right. Yeah. So they're, they're all trying to figure out how to deal with this right now. So I would say if you're doing it to resell, just be very careful of that. I know a guy in Los Angeles whose buyer wants to pay X and the appraisal came in 125000 lower. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how he's going to solve that problem, but that's just what it got appraised at. So. Mm. No. Normally, when that happens, I suggest people put a, because they have to make up the difference between the appraisal and the purchase price, right? If they want to still pay that purchase price, that's right. they have to put the difference in cash. So I usually recommend the buyer just put less down payment, shift some of their cash, unless they're a minimum down payment person, then you can't do that. But normally it just means that they're overpaying, but a lot of people want to, because in their minds, the property's worth what they think it's worth. Not yeah. what the appraiser says, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you've built it, you can either rent it out or not rent it out. In your case, you're reselling the property, right? So the batch I'm doing right now, I'm keeping. They're on your property, so to speak. Yes. The ones that I'm going to end up flipping, actually, I've got a batch of those in LA. Mm. And we'll see. We'll see how that plays out when it comes time to list these. Maybe there will actually be some comps on the market by then. Yeah, that would be nice. So some of these are longer projects, and I don't anticipate selling them till maybe the spring of next year. Right. So if that's the case, then maybe I'll have some comparables by then. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the ADU is a great idea because so many families – can't afford to buy their own home, right? So having this, they can actually buy a home that has an extra home and I'll be able to live there. Or younger first-time buyers even could buy together, right? They can yeah. buy a home with this ADU and each own a home, even though they're, and they're not related because living together is a whole nother matter. If you're just friends at work and you want to invest together, you may not want to live in the same exact. It's brilliant for that reason too, right? Is helping people own homes sooner than later. Yes. Yeah. Well, as we kind of get closer to wrapping up, I wanted to open it to questions to see if anyone has questions while we're doing this. And I know two people don't. Let me see. So, George, did you have any questions for our guest? And if you guys want, you can use the chat box, too. There's a little bubble that says chat, and you can type your question if you have a question for our guest, Christy. So what were we going to talk about here? I got my little notes. Process, the rules, the cost. So for your properties that you already own, it's worth doing the ADU because you, you have a, also a lower price point. You're holding on to the property. So are you financing these? Are you using cash? How are you paying for all this construction costs? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a lot of money going out all at once. 11 properties getting... Yes, it's a lot of money. The ones that I'm flipping, mm -hmm. I try to, when I buy them... I try to line up the financing in my head right from the get-go. So I might just get financing, you know, initially for the purchase. Mm -hmm. To keep paying on money for construction that you're not going to actually start spending until four months from now when plans are approved, that's money spent for nothing. Yeah. So 
down the road, I've been getting second trustee lenders for the construction part. Okay. Uh, on these ones that I'm that I've decided I want to keep, I've been coming out of pocket with the money. Uh huh. With the idea that these things will appraise, and then I can refinance the hard money that I have on the mm -hmm. home into a regular loan. A regular loan. Got it. Um, but the trouble is, they're not coming in at full appraisal. I still have quite a bit of money into these properties of my own, which God, I yeah. wasn't anticipating, but it's nothing for harmful to me because I can just go out and flip a few more houses and you know, make that up. Right. So, yeah. It's And whittle down the debt. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky to figure out how to finance these. And for the homeowner that might be listening in and wondering, well, how can they get financing? Mm -hmm. you know, it's just talking to a couple different bankers out there and figuring out if there's a way to do it. And, and mm -hmm. that's all I'm doing right now to try and figure this out. Right. So, so you can get a home equity line of credit, but that's temporary in the sense that it's tied to the prime rate, the interest rate goes up, right? So now you've got quite a big debt that could go up and up and up in payment. So probably refinancing your property is the best way. Okay. One of our people here, Keith, says, that this is a fascinating topic and it's very informative, but it seems like it would be hard to do as a part-time job. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, yeah. So if someone wanted to build one on their property, they still have to be there every day, make sure the construction's going, make sure, I mean, this would take a few hours to go down to the city, study what the rules are. Well, I, wouldn't, I would say if you're a homeowner and you have a job, my friend's doing this. She's a homeowner. She has a job. She lives in Irvine. And she found time to go down to the city on her lunch break and get mm -hmm. the rules and figure out could she do this. Mm -hmm. From there, I referred her my architect. And they've been working together. And now he does all the running around. And it's, so it's one right. of the people you can trust. Okay. So she gets him to go the back and forth and do the design. And she approves it. And... She's around in the evenings to keep an eye on the construction eventually when it mm -hmm. starts construction. So I would say it's not impossible to do this as a homeowner. Just okay. walk, that would be that would be straightforward. I would say mm -hmm. it's hard to. <laughs> I mean, I work more than full time right now just to manage what I have. All of this. Hopefully, you know. I mean, I don't want to work like a crazy person all my life. I want to do this work hard for a couple of years to get these set up and then hopefully mm -hmm. the cash flow starts coming in. Right, right, right. So you're building up more because really it sounds like based on your success, you could just stop now with the cash you have and possibly live off of that, right? I had those rentals back in 2013 that bringing in great cash flow, but they were owned with a partner and we just decided we just didn't want to own those anymore. And we sold them. So I had a chunk of cash. And when you, the hardest thing for an investor to do when they have a chunk of cash is to not do anything, they have to go spend it somehow. This is what I've chosen to do with my money. Now, could you take that same money and go to Memphis and buy that same $180,000? You could buy two single family houses free and clear with it and have $950 per house coming in every month. Mm -hmm. I could have done that. So it's I could be a note investor. It's mm -hmm. all trade off with what you decide to do with your money and how you want to invest it. Mm -hmm. so I look at what my longer term plan is, and that is to hold these things and get them paid off and have better cash flow than what I will get now off of them down the road because the loan will be paid off. Mm -hmm. So when I want to have these long term, and I want to have these to pass on to you know, my family. So it all it's case by case with really what people want to do and how they see this as part of their financial future. Mm -hmm. This is a question that just came to mind. Do you only flip homes, how single family homes, or do you flip bigger units or things like that? I've done up to three units. Okay. And that's only because I tend to keep my resale prices under a million. Oh. I dipped into a couple of properties that one was a duplex and one was a triplex and fixed up they retailed for one point two to one point four. Mm. Well really that's more like paying six hundred a unit. Mm -hmm. So again I knew who my end buyer was going to be. It was going to be somebody who would live in one 
and have the income from the other one to offset their, their mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. So that made it a sort of a safer flip for me. But I don't really get into multi-million dollar stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's not your niche, I guess. Not my specialty at all. Yeah. So you flip homes that are just in the regular average person neighborhood kind of thing. Average home. Yep. Which, yep. Is that a good description? Okay. Yep. And are you finding the flipping business more difficult now that prices have gone up? Or is there still, because still, you're all by referral, right? So there's still homes out there being referred to that have enough profit in them. Oh yeah. yeah. Cause that's a myth. I think that's circulating out there. Maybe it's people who don't aren't doing the flipping correctly. that <laughs> Don't look for a good enough deal. I don't know, but people are like, Oh, no one can make money flipping anymore. No, they're out there. For sure. Lots of opportunity, huh? Yeah. When you get a property by referral, it's somebody who's already trusting you because of whoever that referral source was. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're making an effort to make it a win-win, you're trying to give them a fair price for the condition it's in. And I mean, I tell them right up front, look, I'm in business to make a profit. I'm making a profit on this flip. Right. They understand that. They want me to. Mm -hmm. I, I sellers come back five months later when they see it on the MLS and like, oh my gosh, this house is beautiful. Thank you for restoring it to the way that we would want it to be remembered. Mm comments like this well that's nice yeah i didn't low ball i didn't rip somebody off i gave right. them a place that they thought was fair and they're not out there shopping it or putting it on the mls you're just dealing directly with them so you can make mm -hmm. that offer and know what's going to get accepted interesting okay well thanks for spending time with us today sorry your video <laughs> didn't yeah. work yeah. That would be nice to see your whiteboard. For all the geeks out here, we'd love to see the whiteboard <laughs> and the tracking. So anyway, so thank you very much for sharing your time and your knowledge and just spending some good time with us today. And hopefully we'll see you soon. I do know that you're going to be a speaker upcoming. If people want to get a hold of you and ask you questions or thank you, how would they get in touch with you and where could they see you out there in the world coming up? Oh, well, yes, there is an event on March 23rd. It's a uh, women's real estate network. And then that is in Los Angeles, full day event. Generally to get in touch with me, I'm on Facebook. I post some comical property finds. You would like to be my friend. <laughs> Very entertaining for sure. <laughs> Send me a message and say, I heard you on the podcast so that I know you're not just some random person. I'll, I'll add you as a friend. And that would be the best way to connect with me through that. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Christy. I'm just really happy you were able to do this and enlighten us on the ADUs. And you're doing much more than I even thought. So that's exciting. I'll look forward to seeing pictures on Facebook. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Athena. I appreciate okay. the opportunity. Okay. okay. Talk okay. to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of My Cashflow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We wish you all the success you deserve as you use what you've learned here out in the real world. Check out the blog post for this episode, along with many more helpful resources at mycashflowacademy.com.